Now we're nearing the end like a high-speed train of the Channel 4 News pop-up week, where we've been asking you for your views and stories and hunting for evidence of economic green shoots at ground level. We've been across the country, from Foy in Cornwall to Swindon, Middlesbrough and the Lakes. And tonight we're in Edinburgh, where Jackie Long joins us now. Jackie. Well, welcome to Edinburgh, Scotland's capital, home of the Edinburgh Festival, of course. Later, we'll look at the story viewers here wanted to be told, whether the vast sums spent on big transport schemes are really justified. There are regional HS2s all over Britain. I'll also talk to the writer Ian Rankin and to a former American ambassador. Let's focus first, though, on the economy. For visitors, it's sometimes easy to forget that beyond the festival crowds, there's a real city grappling with the problems and challenges and also the opportunities the world economy brings. Britain's economic recovery should be based on exports, that's what the government wants. But in a Britain whose ability to make and sell things has been in long-term decline, how realistic is that? Our business correspondent Sarah Smith has been to the Isle of Isla to find out. The weather in Scotland isn't always perfect, but the scenery in places like the Western Isles never disappoints making tourism one of Scotland's largest industries. But we can't send the views overseas. And for the UK economy to really pick up, we do need to boost our exports. So I've come here to find out how that might be done. Even in the depths of recession, Britain knew what we wanted the recovery to look like. Here was a chance to rebalance the British economy, to move away from cheap consumer credit and start making things again, things that you could touch and then sell overseas. An export-led recovery was what we wanted. Now, the truth is that hasn't really happened yet, not across Britain anyway, but it is happening in some places, like here on Isla. Brookladi whiskey is a perfect little story of how the recovery was meant to happen. An old disused distillery brought back from the dead a few years ago by a pair of entrepreneurial investors. It's now the biggest employer on the Isle of Isla. Inside, I discovered it looks more like a working museum, using old copper stills installed in the 19th century, and using traditional skills to produce a thoroughly modern single malt whiskey. Brookladi export 90% of their product, which helped them weather the UK downturn. But like many British firms, they do sell a lot to Europe, where the recession has hit even harder. We've lost some business in the Eurozone. Uh, we used to sell quite reasonable quantities to Italy, to Spain, Portugal. Uh, we're not selling to those countries at all at the moment. Um, you know, they're not in the market to buy. And also there are potential risks to small business, um, you know, credit worthiness, that kind of issue. Brookladi say they just aren't ready, aren't big enough yet to sell into the fast-growing emerging economies where Britain needs to establish itself if we're going to significantly expand our exports. On the other side of the country, Diageo produce whiskey on an entirely different scale. They're the largest premium drinks company in the world, filling half a million bottles with scotch every day at their plant in Fife. Many of them blends, like Dimple, you won't see on the shelves in British shops, produced solely for the export market. And they sell more familiar brands like Johnny Walker into 180 different countries. Johnny Walker whiskey was actually one of the UK's first mass-produced exports. And it's all because Alexander Walker, Johnny's son, put it in these square bottles to make it easier to transport. And it's still working, because this whole production line will be going to Mexico 99% of all of this whiskey is sold overseas. For Diageo, it has been crucial to grow their sales in emerging markets to make up for the downturn in the Eurozone that's hit many British exporters hard. 87% of our growth in Scotch whiskey comes from emerging markets, so we really see them as the growth vehicle for the future. Also last year, the US grew 14% as well, but we really see emerging markets as the real platform for growth for the future for us. Establishing your brands in countries like China is all very well when you're one of the biggest companies in the world. For much smaller firms like Lin, it is a lot harder. In Glasgow, they manufacture very high-end, very high-priced stereo systems. 
and they'd love to sell more of their handmade hi-fis into places like China, but they're struggling to find a way in. It's very easy to sit in a management ivory tower back in the UK and say, well, we should be much bigger in China. It's another thing altogether to actually do it. Scottish whiskey is, is, is a huge success story out there. However, I'm sure that there's smaller companies like ours who are maybe seeing inroads, making slow inroads into the market, but aren't seeing the kind of explosive growth that you might think would be in a country with so much wealth out there that's, that's doing so well. Lin are so eager to get into China, the boss has been living in Shanghai to try to better understand onerous Chinese regulations and restrictions, and is still finding it very difficult to sell his stereos there. Possibly one reason why British companies still export more to Belgium than we do to Brazil, Russia, India and China combined. At a time when recession in the Eurozone means it is vitally important to break into new, expanding markets. The benefits of a thriving export sector are obvious in places like Isla. 60 new jobs in the distillery. Even the farmers growing the barley for Brucladi feel the boost. Here, they really are enjoying an export-led recovery, one that hasn't yet spread across the UK mainland. And Sarah is with me now. Well, Sarah, is there anything that the government could or should be doing to make exporting easier for these companies? Well, let's start with a specific example, like that hi-fi company, Lynn, in Glasgow. They say it is enormously expensive and time-consuming when they're trying to sell their products into China to go through all the regulations and safety inspections that the Chinese authorities absolutely insist upon. When these products have gone through almost exactly the same inspections to be allowed to be sold in the EU, they would be delighted if the government could negotiate a trade deal with China that said you will accept the EU authorizations and allow these products in. That would make a huge difference to them. And on the bigger picture, it's really a question of priorities. It's only two years since George Osborne said that he wanted to see Britain carried aloft by the march of the makers. And since then, we have seen recovery beginning, but it's not based on exports and manufacturing. It's built on consumer spending and rising house prices. And the wrong kind of recovery, a lot of people would say. And so the worry is, is the government losing patience with exports and manufacturing? If they can stimulate growth elsewhere, will it remain a priority? And there is some more economic news today, good or bad? Uh, good news, the Office of National Statistics have revised up the GDP, for, well, the GDP numbers for the second quarter of 2013. They now say the UK economy grew by 0.7% instead of 0.6%. That is not stellar growth. Nobody's going to say that's brilliant, but it does suggest the recovery's got some momentum. Sarah Smith, thanks very much.